Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining. Today on The Joseph Carlson Show, news has gotten worse for Nikola over the past week. The scrutiny upon this company and Trevor Milton has only intensified. Now they're being featured in the Financial Times. They have other short sellers outside of Hindenburg, like Andrew Left, calling them a complete fraud. They have investors like Whitney Tilson releasing memos saying that Trevor Milton is going to end up behind bars. These are very strong allegations against Nikola. We're going to give a full update on the situation. I'll give you my thoughts on it. We also have big news from Apple. They had their next event. Uh, they unveiled the iPad Air. They unveiled a new watch, as well as their sweeping bundle service, where they're bundling together a lot of their services in this move to become a service software company. This is what I've been talking about for a while for Apple. This is the reason that I invested in them so heavily is because they're becoming a service company. They're moving to a better business model. So we're gonna be talking about this as well as the companies that it's making a little bit nervous. They frighten Peloton and Spotify a little bit. In fact, Spotify said that what Apple's doing is completely unfair. So we'll be looking into that. We also have news like Disney releasing the Mandalorian season two trailer. We're gonna take a look at that. And then we have some good news. Store Capital, during a time when lots of companies have been struggling and they've been cutting their dividends, Store Capital is a big dividend payer and they raised their dividend almost 3%. So that's some great news. That's one of my top holdings. It's a company I've been talking about for a while. On that note, we're gonna be looking at my portfolio. I'll be giving a full update on it, as well as answering a lot of your guys' questions. So we have a lot to get to. Before getting into all of this, I have to mention that we do have a Patreon. It helps support the channel. If you want to join that, you get a lot of different benefits like access to a private Discord investing group, a custom developed portfolio tracking website that we're we're literally building it from the ground up. So I've hired a developer. We're building this thing ourselves. Uh, so you get access to that as well as exclusive episodes of the Joseph Carlson show. We have four exclusive episodes so far. So like two hours of content. And then there's just a lot more stuff. I can't go into all of it now, but if you want to check it out, it's no risk. Cancel anytime. There's a link in the description. Okay, first of all, let's start with an update of Nikola. This situation has grown more intense over the past week. As we know, Nikola gave their rebuttal, their big response to the Hindenburg research on their company, accusing them of fraud. Nikola released their big rebuttal Monday morning, in which they basically admitted that many of the core things that Hindenburg said against them, the core accusations that Hindenburg claimed against them, Nikola said, yeah, that's basically what we did with a few caveats. That's basically what we did. We did, in fact, roll a truck down a hill. We did, in fact, film it in a way where it would be highly deceiving. But our big gotcha was that we said the truck was in motion and not in operation. And that's their big defense. Wordplay. They were splitting hairs over wordplay, as one of the commenters in my previous video said. That's the perfect description. Nikola is basically relying on wordplay as their primary defense for what I consider a highly deceptive video. I think that any investor watching that video would be highly deceived by it. And I think that Nikola designed it that way intentionally. I think they wanted investors to believe that that truck was driving itself. So that's their big defense. Now, Hindenburg responded to Nikola's rebuttal saying, we view Nikola's response as a tacit admission of securities fraud. I basically agree with Hindenburg. And for the record, I've read through what Hindenburg has claimed against Nikola. I've read through Nikola's response. I've looked at it through an objective third party standpoint where I've tried to rid myself of any biases of the situation. And I basically agree with almost everything that Hindenburg is saying. I think that they're much more accurate in their descriptions than what Nikola's saying. Hindenburg, for the most part, has been spot on with their accusations. So that's where that's at right now. Now, there's one thing I have to address, and that is Nikola, as part of their defense, continually repeats that Hindenburg is a short seller and that they will profit if Nikola's stock price goes down. The reason that Nikola is repeating that is to say Hindenburg is financially motivated for the destruction of our company. They're financially motivated because they'll financially gain if our company goes down in flames. While that's true, I don't think that that's a good defense at all. I think that's a very weak defense. You can look at any situation where a company gets exposed for fraud or just a fraud in general is exposed and the person that exposes it, the organization that exposes it always gains. They're always financially or reputationally rewarded. Harry Markopoulos was the guy that uncovered the Bernie Madoff scam. He was the one that alerted authorities multiple times. Did he financially benefit for exposing this fraud? Of course he did. 
He got his name known. He has Wikipedia articles written about him. Uh, he has special deals with investigators. He's been able to give speeches because of it. He's elevated his reputation of it. This gives him notoriety. Look at Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes. The person that exposed that massive fraud was a guy named John Carreyou. He was an investigative journalist working for the Wall Street Journal, and he started poking questions at Theranos. He was the one that uncovered it. Did he monetarily benefit from uncovering this massive fraud? Of course he did. He basically became a household name in investigative journalism. He uncovered a massive fraud, and he benefited from it monetarily. In fact, he wrote a book that I'm sure he made millions of dollars from. So the whole defense that Nikola keeps repeating, that Hindenburg is just a short seller, they just want to make money, that is a very weak defense. Basically, everybody throughout history that has exposed a fraud has financially benefited because of that. So there's nothing unique about Hindenburg wanting to expose this and at the same time make some money doing it. There's nothing unique about that. So that's the first thing I'd note. The second thing I want to mention is this whole deal with GM does not really legitimize Nikola in my mind. I don't think it adds much legitimacy to the deal because we know previously that deals have been made from small startup companies to big companies without the big companies doing proper due diligence. Again, giving the example of Theranos, the Financial Times points out here that there was early investors. They included Henry Kissinger, Robert Murdoch, Oracle founder Larry Ellison, as well as a bunch of other people that joined on later that they made deals with, with Theranos on the assumption that everybody else before them had done proper due diligence. They're basically using the validity of some of these names as validation for Theranos. So you had Walgreens being the ultimate validation of Theranos. They brought these machines into their store without even testing them. And the reason that Walgreens did this is because they assumed that the early board members had done their due diligence. So it was a domino effect of investors one after one, that assumed the previous investors had done due diligence. The same thing could be happening with Nikola. You had early investors like Bosch and some others that did investments with Nikola, and now you have GM joining as well. The Financial Times also pressed Trevor Milton on what he actually brings to the deal with GM. What does GM actually get out of this deal besides the $2 billion of stocks? Basically a call option on Nikola as a company. He said uh, over-the-air software updates on the infotainment system. Over-the-air software updates on the infotainment system was the only thing that he listed off specifically. He also said all the stuff that is very, very delicate and most of the entire core of the vehicle is RIP. So a bunch of vague answers. The only thing that he could list off specifically is the infotainment system. Mind you, this is a company that's currently worth $12 billion that has their big thing that they're bringing to this deal, the infotainment system. Now, of course, with vague statements like that, it makes people a little bit skeptical. Along with the piece from Hindenburg, a lot of other people now are piling on to Nikola, saying this company is a fraud. Andrew Left is one of them. When we saw a video of this vehicle moving, it wasn't under its own propulsion. Uh, they've moved on, obviously, from the Nikola one, but, but this, I think, is a problem for them. Well, it just shows the quality of the company, uh, it's the honesty of the company. When you're paying $10, $15 billion for a startup company with an unproven product, you would like to think that what they put out is actually true and what you see, what your eyes see, is actually what it is. So now them backtracking saying, well, we never actually said that the, co that the truck was moving on its own propulsion doesn't really hold much weight with investors. And like I said, and when you hear Trevor respond to it, it just does not give you the comfort that I would want as an investor. So that alone, when I see the company's response and their body language, makes me believe they're covering more things up. Andrew Left is obviously right that the company was deceptive in that video, but I think where he gets it wrong is saying that investors want to be able to not be tricked by the company they're investing in. Nikola seems to have plenty of investors still piling money into this company, despite evidence of them being highly deceptive. That's the most confounding part of this whole story. Why are people still investing in a company that has a track record of deception? Now, even in addition to Andrew Left, there's other investors like Whitney Tilson, a hedge fund manager, that have even taken this a step further, saying that they're predicting that Trevor Milton will end up behind bars. He said in his daily newsletter, I can confidently predict that General Motors will end the partnership with Nikola that it announced last week. Nikola's stock will collapse and Milton will end up behind bars for securities fraud. That's his predictions on it. Now, with all this news and this scrutiny under Nikola, what are they actually doing right now? Well, for one, Trevor Milton has stopped tweeting. 
That's one thing. He usually tweets quite often. So for him to completely stop, it's definitely not normal. He's doing this because he's probably received counsel that said, look, stop tweeting. You're only going to incriminate yourself if you keep tweeting and it's not going to help you. So I'm sure he's just laying low right now. He doesn't want to give out any information that all of his critics are going to pick apart and use against him. A lot of the Hindenburg report was... It was sourced from things that they said on social media, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. That's where a lot of it came from, as well as YouTube. So for him to stop tweeting, I think is a pretty big move. He's normally the outspoken one. So Trevor Milton has stopped tweeting, but Nikola hasn't stopped doing their their basic way of advertising. The way that they've been running the company so far seems to have continued on. They're running this Facebook ad right now. On today's edition of Badger versus the World, We've got an Audi R8. Now this is a supercar, but let's do some quick comparisons. What's your acceleration? Zero to 60 in three seconds. Badger, zero to 60 in 2.9 seconds. What is your fuel range? 350 miles on one tank. Well, the Badger does 300 miles on battery alone, all the way up to 600 miles with the fuel cell. Okay, so they're comparing the Nikola Badger with the Audi R8, and they have a lot better specs for the Badger. Keep in mind, The Audi R8 is a a car that exists that's being driven by people, and the Badger doesn't exist. So they're comparing a car off to the left, which is a a graphic behind them, a Photoshop graphic, to a real car parked right behind them off to the right. This is literally an ad running right now. What's your horsepower? 610 horses. And the Badger has 906, along with 900 foot-pounds of torque. What's the price? A lot. 200K. 200K. So you can buy roughly three Badgers for the price of one Audi R8. Those are great stats for a car that doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. There's no Badger. Nobody's driving it. They don't even show a prototype of the vehicle yet, but they're comparing it directly with the R8. This is the issue that Nikola has been continually getting itself in trouble with, is they're not selling anything, they're not producing anything, but they're making these bold claims. And they're continuing to do this to this day. This whole company so far has been sales, sales, sales. It's been all talk. If you're impressed by the specs of the Nikola Badger, you can order one today. And everybody who places an order for Nikola Badger also gets a chance to win one. So the good news is they are accepting orders today for the Nikola Badger. My question is, though, I'd have to ask them, am I going to get a real vehicle that drives by itself? Or are they going to send me like a a Photoshop document? Are they going to send me a PSD of the mockups of it? Normally, for, for normal companies, I wouldn't have to clarify something like that. But for this company, you really have to do make those those clarifications. You have to make those considerations. You really have to look at the wording, uh, you know, because they have a tendency to kind of split hairs on this type of thing. So just make sure if you buy a car from Nikola that you're actually going to get a vehicle and not a Photoshop document. And I do like that they mention that if you order one of their vehicles, you have a chance of winning a free vehicle. So they're trying to get people in there based off this lottery ticket system that, hey, even if I just order one, I have a chance of winning a free one. So a little bit of a lottery ticket system there. So the company's running those Facebook ads, trying to get pre-orders for the Nikola Badger. What else are they doing right now? Well, they're building their factory. Here's an aerial view of the factory they announced a couple months ago. So Just looking at this, it has an overhead view. Somebody with a drone is flying it over every day, filming the progress of it. It doesn't look like a whole bunch has happened so far. So far, I don't see a whole lot of work happening. Now I'll say, I don't really know how quick major construction projects are supposed to take like this. So I can't really say whether or not they're on schedule or not. I'll just say right now, it doesn't look like a whole lot is happening. But I've seen construction projects before where it does seem like it takes a long time for it to get started. So on this, I'll give Nikola the benefit of the doubt. I don't really know what's going on here. Just from an aerial view though, the last look that we have at this factory in Arizona, it doesn't look like a whole lot is happening. So what does this mean for investors? What does this mean for the stock price? We gotta keep in mind that investing is about looking at the future, not looking at the past. If you look at the past, Nikola has obviously done things that I think are are objectively deceiving. I think that they've done things that are not really business trustworthy. So those are things they've done in the past, but I think a lot of people are buying the company right now, or at least holding it to the point where it's worth $13 billion because they're looking at the future. They're saying, well, Nikola might get fined. They might get in trouble with the SEC, but lots of companies are successful that historically had trouble with the SEC, right? There's some companies that did have fraud, like uh, waste management. They had a big fraud and now they're a pretty good holding. So maybe Nikola will have the same thing happen. I think there's that aspect to look at. So this is not a company that I plan on investing in or that I plan on shorting. 
I think that it would equally be dangerous to short a company like this. Maybe you do it and hopefully it works out for you, but that is a really risky thing to do in my opinion. There's a lot of money trying to find companies to put it in right now. We saw what happened with the Snow IPO. A lot of money is looking for any company to put it into. Nikola is one that people will buy just because they had a partnership with GM and they're an electric vehicle company. As far as I'm concerned, I would say buyer beware and short seller beware. I think either side you're taking a lot of risk with a company like this. Okay, next up I want to talk about Apple. This is my largest holding. They recently announced two new products, the iPad Air and the Apple Watch Series 6. Now starting with the iPad Air, first impressions on this is that it looks more like an iPad Pro. It has the sharp edges. It looks really, really beautiful. Small bezels, sharp edges, a beautiful screen. It has a very fast processor and it's at a cheap price point. So I think this thing is gonna be extremely successful. I think a lot of people are gonna be picking this up, especially with all the learning from home, um, all the people that are kind of learning more digitally now. I think this product is gonna fit in really well with education. So this product I think is gonna be very successful. Like I said, the other product they announced was the Apple Watch Series 6, which amongst a bunch of, of different features that it has, one of them that I think is the most important is this one right here. Imagine a day, a future, imagine a future, one day, tiny device, blah, 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 that uses red and infrared light to measure your blood oxygen level. Yes? What? No, 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 no. Don't you dare say it. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Thank you. So we already knew that the Apple Watch could measure your heart rate, it can do things like the electric cardiogram, it can measure your steps, it can measure your workouts, it can show you the notifications and do all of that stuff, but now it can literally measure your blood oxygen level right on your wrist. This is a healthcare company. Apple is a healthcare company amongst a lot of different companies. It's a fintech company, a movie and TV production company, and a bunch of other things. So this is the future I see with Apple, that they are merging out of one thing, they are spanning out and they're being successful in many of the things that they're going into. Now, on top of measuring your blood oxygen levels, the Apple Watch has now been sold in combination with Apple Fitness Plus. This is exercise content. Apple is now creating exercise content similar to what Peloton's doing. So this is in direct competition with Peloton. You don't really have the same devices, so I do think there's some differences. I actually don't think that this is going to hurt Peloton. I think it's similar to other streaming services entering into Netflix, what they're doing. So this is another growing part of Apple's business. They're now coming out with fitness content. Now, all of that news is exciting. The iPad Air, the Apple Watch, Apple Fitness, but by far the biggest news of this event was their Apple One bundle. This is the biggest news. This is Apple showing that they are becoming a giant service company. They're becoming a service company and they're gonna have that nice, monthly revenue from it. We can look at the tiers and what they include. The individual plan for $14.95 a month is Apple Music, Apple TV, Apple Arcade, and 50 gigs of iCloud. Then you have a family plan. It's basically the same thing. It's almost 20 bucks a month, but you get 200 gigs of iCloud and you share with up to five other people. So that's the family plan. And then the premiere for almost 30 bucks a month, you get Apple Music, Apple TV Plus, Apple Arcade, you get two terabytes of iCloud, Apple News Plus, and Apple Fitness Plus, which is coming late 2020. All for 30 bucks a month. This is the master plan of Apple, to become this service company, to get people wrapped up into their services and pay them monthly. This is why they don't mind having their devices last five years. They do make money on the sale of devices, but it's more important for them to keep you in their ecosystem for as long as possible, because the services are the future of the company. Making money through their app store, every digital sale, 30% of that, plus these different plans that they're coming out with is the future of this company. This is going to be absolutely huge. And it's specifically concerning to some other companies that are competing with specific services. For instance, Spotify is a direct competitor to Apple Music. Apple Music is by far Spotify's biggest competitor, by far their biggest threat. And then this bundle is really difficult for Spotify to compete against because you have people that they would enjoy 50 gigs of iCloud. That would allow them to back up all their devices and do a lot of things with. And they might like Apple TV Plus to see a couple movies on it. But if they want both of those, they might say, you know what, I'll pay the 15 bucks a month and get both of them in this bundle. And then I can cancel Spotify and save that $10 a month there. So basically I'm getting all of this for like five bucks a month difference. This heavily disadvantages Spotify. 
So much so that Spotify actually released a public statement complaining about the Apple One bundle, saying, once again, Apple is using its dominant position and unfair practices to disadvantage competitors and deprive consumers by favoring its own services. We call on competition authorities to act urgently to restrict Apple's anti-competitive behavior, which if left unchecked, will cause irreparable harm to the developer community and threaten our collective freedoms to listen, learn, create, and connect. Now, Apple responded to it, kind of ignoring it, basically saying that the customers have a variety of alternatives that they can go to. That if people want to use Spotify, the price hasn't gone up for Spotify. Apple's just offered what they think is a really good deal for their services. But customers obviously have choice in the matter. They're not restricted from choosing Spotify. So that was basically Apple's response. And many people have pointed out that Spotify is complaining about the unfair business practices of Apple while Spotify is making the open podcast system, where normally you have one podcast feed, you just put it on every service like we have in the Joseph Carlson show, and people can listen for free. Spotify is in the process of breaking up that open podcast system and making it so that there's exclusive podcasts like the Joe Rogan podcast. So a lot of people are saying, well, Spotify... You're complaining about things that are bad for consumers, but you're breaking up this amazing open system of podcasts. So there's criticisms being launched both ways, but Spotify is not happy about this Apple One bundle. Now, Spotify isn't the only company that this bundle gives a disadvantage to. Peloton, like I mentioned, is another one where they have a company like Apple coming into their business now with Apple Fitness content creation, and they do have one physical device, their watch. That's basically the only fitness device. Peloton's CEO responded to this announcement by saying, it's a legitimization of fitness content. He basically said, look, we know that Apple's coming into this, but all this does is legitimize what we're doing. If the biggest company in the world is trying to follow our lead into what we are already doing, that shows that we've done a good job. I think that this is the proper response. When Reed Hastings was running Netflix, a lot of other competitors started to make their own streaming services, and he said that's not going to hurt Netflix. And he said it pretty confidently, and it wasn't something that he didn't believe himself. He said that all it does is legitimize streaming as a concept, and more and more people will move from cable to streaming overall, of which will be a big slice of that pie will be a big portion of that pie. This is what I think will happen with Peloton. I think that Peloton will continue to grow, even with Apple going into fitness content, because it'll draw more people overall into that category, and many of them might start with Apple Fitness Plus and go, you know what, I wanna do this on a bigger level. I wanna buy a bike that has a lot more integrations with it. So overall, I'm very excited about this announcement from Apple, especially the service bundle. As an investor, I think that's the most important step that they've made out of everything that they've announced so far. That service bundle creates a more reliable monthly revenue for the company. A lot of people are confused of why Apple's valued at above a 30 PE ratio as opposed to their traditional 15 PE ratio. I think there's a lot of factors that play into this. A lot of money looking for places to go and Apple's an easy place to put it. But I think over time, the, the multiple that Apple's trading at will continue to go up as they transition to a highly reliable monthly revenue. That's more important than hardware sales. There's a reason that people will accept a lesser return for treasury bonds as opposed to stocks. The reason that they're willing to accept a lesser return is because treasury bonds give a more reliable return. The same thing is happening with Apple. They're moving into a more reliable revenue stream. So their multiple should go up as they continue to move more to services. Now, another company I want to talk about is also one of my biggest holdings, which is Disney. I currently have 65 shares of it. They recently released their movie Milan, and it did not get the best reception. 51% from audience and 75% from critics on Rotten Tomatoes. Not the best reviews, especially for a Disney movie. Usually they get really high reviews. So this one wasn't great. There's some political issues going on with China as well uh, that I think caused some problems for Mulan. But even so, the early estimates are that Mulan made a lot of money. It says that Disney's Mulan has reportedly already made more money than Tenet. There's been firms that try to do analysis on how much Disney made with Mulan because it's not official. They haven't come out and released how much they've made, but they believe it's somewhere around $261 million within the first week of the United States. So that's viewed as a positive. That would be them making back at least the money they invested in it. But this isn't what I think is important with Disney. Like I've said before, many times when talking about Disney, subscriber growth is the most important thing. Subscriber growth of Disney Plus, which is their direct-to-consumer streaming service, I think that's the most important number. The last number that we have from early August is that Disney Plus grows to more than 60.5 million subscribers. So they got over 60 million 
I don't know what this number's at right now, but I'm assuming it's growing quite a bit because in order to watch Mulan, you had to have Disney Plus. I think that's one thing that helped grow the service. And I think the next thing that will help grow Disney Plus subscribers, and especially bring back any subscribers that canceled, is The Mandalorian Season 2. Here's some of the trailer of it. Show me the one whose safety deemed such destruction. place for a child wherever i go he goes so i've heard this is the way okay now i'm no professional film critic but that to me looks really good especially if you like Star Wars. If you like the first season of The Mandalorian, I think you're going to want to watch this. And I think that more importantly, this will continue to bring in a lot of subscribers. The release date of The Mandalorian Season 2 is going to be October 30th. That's when they'll start their week-by-week -week episodes. So a lot of people are going to sign up just to see this series. And then they're also releasing Mulan for free December 4th, so before the end of the year. And I think a lot of people will join Disney Plus to be able to see this without the $30 price point. Between these two releases, plus anything else that Disney Plus releases by the end of the year, I can see them gaining a lot of subscribers. They're opening up a new market, they're releasing this key content on their service. I could see Disney Plus getting close to 100 million subscribers by the end of the year. So I remain very positive on Apple, I remain positive on Disney, and I'm also positive on Store Capital. This is a company I talked about that I was investing some money in. It's now my second largest holding. I have 422 shares of it. I was excited especially because they recently announced that they're increasing their dividend for the year, 2.9%. So not a huge increase. If you've been following Store Capital, you'll see that they normally increase their dividend by about 6% year over year. That's been their average is 6%. So a 2.9% increase is about half their average. I was just happy to see that they kept the dividend. I wasn't even expecting a 2.9% increase. With the year that we've gone through and a company that lends out to you know, sub investment grade businesses. I was expecting them to just barely increase the dividend, maybe give like a 0.1% increase, like a penny increase, which is more of a symbolic one. But no, they actually did a real increase. 2.9% is a notable increase during a year that's been pretty terrible for real estate. So that was some good news. I was excited to see that from Store Capital. But overall, the last couple of weeks, the portfolio has gone down quite a bit with the market. I'm now at a gain of $10,000. I was at a gain of like $16,000 a couple of weeks ago. If I look at the one month view here, September 2nd, this portfolio value was $125,700. And now it's gone down to $120,266. So we've dropped $6,000 in just the past two weeks. This has followed the S&P 500. If we go to September 2nd, and then I go to now, we're down 7.56%. So a pretty decent drop over just the past couple of weeks. I'm sure most people have seen that in their portfolios. I think this is the reason why you have to buy good companies. If they go down in value and you know you own high quality companies that have extremely good growth potential, I think that you're in a good situation. My top holdings like Apple and Disney and Store Capital, I'm very happy with those holdings. I have no concerns about them. Even if the market continues to trade down lower and lower and lower, I still don't have any concerns with it. It doesn't have anything that causes me stress. Now, as most of you know that have been watching the channel, I track my dividends month over month, year over year. I track how much money I made in dividends that month. I've been doing that on spreadsheets, but I've recently been working with developers to create a website that does this for me, that I can track this data and create, I think, better graphs. So that's what I've been doing. This is something that Patreon members have access to. I would give it to everybody. I would have every viewer be able to have access to this. Unfortunately, I am paying for the hosting, I'm paying for the development, and there's a lot of different parts of this that bring in real data. And so all of that is a pretty, pretty good monthly cost. So I have to pay for that with the Patreon. You'll get instant access to it if you do sign up for Patreon. So there's a link in the description if you're interested. But I wanted to show just a couple graphs of this. This one right here is one that we're all familiar with. This shows my month over month dividend growth since the beginning of this portfolio. This is how much money I made every single month since I started this portfolio. You can look at January 2018. I didn't make anything in dividends. And then February as well. And then you can see the growth of it. 
it's a squiggly line. It's uneven. Some months I get more than others, but overall it's trending in the right direction. One that I think that's even more interesting is this graph right here, the income growth year over year. So we have in pink 2018, all these bars in pink represent my income in 2018, and then blue is 2019, and then yellow is 2020. So we can see every single year matched up against each other. You can see the difference. For instance, in March of 2018, I made $8.76 in dividends. And then in March of 2019, I made $108. And then March of 2020, I made $261. This is incredible growth year over year. So I'm continually buying new shares, depositing new money, reinvesting dividends, trying to grow this as fast as possible. And this is something that I like tracking. I think it's just motivating to look at. Okay, now let's move on and get to some emails and questions. We're actually gonna do comments this time. So I have some emails, I'm gonna save that for a later video, but I wanna respond to some of the comments on my previous episode. I thought it would be fun to just kind of uh, rapid fire, go through some of the comments and give my thoughts on it. The first one is from Curiosity Unchained. He has 43 thumbs up on this comment. He says, agree with you completely. Never trust your money with people that split hairs when it comes to the words they use and have deceptive practices. This is referring to the Nicola One video, as well as the other productions that they did. I agree with this 100%. Splitting hairs is the best way to frame this. They're splitting hairs over the wording of it. So this causes me a lot of distrust. Um, that's my biggest thing. I don't know the legal consequences of what they did. Basically, the SEC would have to prove that Nicola intentionally misled investors. That would be the big burden of proof, that they intentionally did that. And that's kind of difficult to prove because... Nicola is going to say, well, we may have inadvertently misled some investors if they didn't read the, the wording of the videos, but we never intentionally misled anyone. That's kind of what their defense is. So this is something that's difficult to prove for the SEC. Clearly, in my mind, they intentionally misled investors, and their defense is basically what you describe as splitting hairs. I think the perfect wording for that. Epic Reddit says, this is why researching a company before buying it is so important. If this is in reference to Nicola, I will say... I don't think investors should be expected to do that level of research, to have to talk to previous employees to see if the company is being highly deceptive during their presentations. I don't think most people should be expected to look at a video like that Nikola One in Motion and try to decipher whether the vehicle was driving itself. It is implied by the nature of the video, by the way that it was filmed, that it was in operation driving itself. So saying that we need to research companies, absolutely agree with that. But if you're referring to companies like Nikola with their videos, I think that's not to be expected for investors. They should not have to be personal detectives and find out whether production like that is intentionally misleading. Brandon Reed says, you should have disclosed at the beginning of the video that Hindenburg is also shorting Nikola stock. It's a very important disclosure and may affect how people view this report. That is true. I should have put that in the last video. That's why I put it right at the beginning of this video. And the reason I wanted to specifically mention it was to kind of debunk this, this defense of Nikola saying that, oh, well, they're a short seller. So that obviously negates any of the claims that they're making. It is true that short sellers are financially motivated to make damaging statements about a company. They're basically taking the opposite position of a company. So they're gonna say things that are damaging to the company. But that doesn't mean that what they're saying isn't true. Like I highlighted at the beginning of this episode, you know, everybody benefits monetarily for exposing a fraud. They benefit from that. Look at all the, the different frauds that have been exposed on various platforms, whether they're company or people. The people that do the big reports exposing them, they elevate their persona, they elevate their reputation, they gain notoriety from it, and in most cases, they directly monetarily benefit from it. So the whole defense that Nikola has that, well, Hindenburg is a short seller, so obviously they're going to come out against us. I don't think that's a good defense. Of course, Hindenburg wants to make money. That's the reason that they funded this giant research paper, this 30-page research paper. They didn't just do that because they had some free time. They did it to make money. So, uh, you know, money is what drives it, but I don't think that that negates the effects of it. I want you to do something. Try to think of how many people expose big frauds and how many of them benefit from it. Most of them, unless it's something that's like inherently dangerous, unless they're exposing, you know, some type of criminal ring that they can get hurt from, in most cases with financial fraud, the people that expose it 
they monetarily benefit from doing it because it saves other people money. So when you have things like Theranos being exposed by John Carreyou, like I said, he wrote a book. He probably made millions from that book. He became more known, more followed. People know his name. Now I know his name. I have the book that he wrote. So he made money doing that. He was also paid to do things like that. So that doesn't negate the work that he did unraveling a fraud. Just like Harry Markopoulos exposing Bernie Madoff, or at least trying to, do you know why Harry Markopoulos went after Bernie Madoff? Why he reported him to the SEC over and over again? It wasn't because Harry Markopoulos was just a nice guy and he was wanting to save uh, people from a lot of trouble. That may have been part of it, but Harry Markopoulos represented an investment firm that was competing for investors with Bernie Madoff. And he was looking at Bernie Madoff's performance and going, this performance is literally unreal. Nobody can achieve this consistent performance, and it makes me upset that he's stealing all this investor money. So he was a competitor to Bernie Madoff. That's the reason that he went after him. So most people that expose financial frauds, they do monetarily benefit from it. I think the defense that Hindenburg is just a short seller is a pretty weak defense. They need to actually address the claims. And so far, the, the ones that they have are, they're, they're basically admitting that most of them were true. Cheng Tao says, this has got to be the easiest stock to short ever, lol. Not that I'm going to do it, but man, Nikola's rebuttal is just going to sink itself. Great work as usual, Joseph. This one, like I said, I would be very cautious about shorting Nikola. You say it's a very easy short. It may seem that way. We're getting blasted with information of, of different practices that Nikola has done that is highly deceptive, of different problems that they're having right now. You know, the whole situation's a mess, and you think the stock price would completely reflect that, that it would go down far below $13 billion. But what we know with investing, something Howard Marks repeatedly says is, what should happen often isn't what does happen. So you can have the best investment thesis or the best short thesis on a company, and that does not mean that that's what's going to happen. I can invest in Disney based off of my different thesis that I come up with, and it could play out differently. We really don't know. So that's the case with investing and shorting companies like this. With a company like Nikola and the appetite for investors that are dumb money to pour money in companies without doing any research other than it's new and exciting, I think it's very dangerous to take a short position like this. And many companies that I think are very poor companies, terrible companies like Herbalife, that in my opinion is a garbage company. I think that it's difficult to short it because they don't always trade the way that they should. We can look at the example of Herbalife. This is a company that Bill Ackman invested over $100 million into exposing it as a pyramid scheme, lobbying the government to actually look into this company and do an investigation on it. He had a short position on it as well. Well, Herbalife sells uh, products, weight loss products, nutritional supplements, uh, vitamins, things like that. But what they, what they really sell and what their distributors make money from is by selling a business, what they call a business opportunity. And the business opportunity is to sell the business opportunity to your friends who in turn sell the business opportunity to their friends. And uh, we don't believe there's really uh, end demand for the product by true retail consumers at the suggested retail prices for the product. How much money have you spent betting against Herbalife? Uh, we have a short position of over a billion dollars. It is illegal to run a pyramid scheme. It's much like a chain letter. If you remember as a kid, you know, you get a letter in the mail and it says, well, you know, send 10, send 10 cents to the, the six people on the, on the envelope who came before you and in three weeks you'll have a thousand dollars. The problem with endless chains, the problem with pyramid schemes, is that it requires an enormous number of recruits at the bottom to feed the people at the top. And inevitably the people at the bottom lose money and only the people at the top make money. And it's not a legitimate business. And it's an, as a result, it's inherently fraudulent. Bill Ackman's description of the company was spot on. He was right. Bill Ackman was 100% correct in his description of the company. And the results were that he likely lost close to a billion dollars betting against it. So there's nothing guaranteed here. There is no guaranteed outcome. Be careful if you're betting on this. Christopher says the CEO and management is one of the most neglected aspects of stock analysis, in my opinion. I want the CEO that's invested in and obsessed with his company, preferably founder-led or at least with a 10% ownership stake. Christopher, this is something I, I think you're right on. I think we definitely should look at the management and who's running the company more than we do. Most people are obsessed with looking at the product of the company. So if it's a tech company, they look at the technology behind it. They don't look at who's driving the decisions behind the technology. They just look at the tech. And I think that's a mistake because the tech changes over time. 
Sometimes on a year-to-year basis, it can transform quite a bit, but the management stays the same. So what you're really investing in is the management and their decision-making, the, the way that they're driving this company and they're driving the products. So it's something that we should pay attention to. I've been trying to do that more with my research. If we look a couple episodes back, I highlighted Christopher Volk as the CEO of Store Capital. The reason that I'm investing so much in Store Capital as opposed to other REITs is because I really like him as a CEO. I think he's uniquely transparent and honest and competent in running that company. So it makes me feel more reassured putting money with his decision-making than other managers. If Christopher Volk did anything half as deceptive as what Nikola's done, I would be totally shocked. That's something I can't imagine someone like him ever doing. So that's the type of management that I'm trying to put my money with. People that I think are honest, transparent, forthcoming, not people that are trying to trick you into investing in their company. So I think you're right. I agree 100%. Okay, well, I think I'm going to end this episode there. I appreciate all of you for listening in. I'll catch you guys next time.